is not for you to know the times or the seasons. That bothers us. What we don't understand here is he's given us the idea of how to focus on what we are supposed to be doing. We got a lot of people running around doing a lot of things for the wrong reasons because they lack understanding. And they even been in church a while, and they, they, they still lack uh, biblical wisdom, which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power. There's some things that are not for you, but there's some things that are. Are you ready? But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Are you ready for, to know what God has given you the Holy Ghost for? It's not for fuzzy goosebumps, dance and spin around, even though sometimes that happens. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and, and unto, everybody say unto, the uttermost part of the earth. Let's place our Bibles down. Let's ask God to speak to our hearts and our minds. And I want to speak to you as an individual. Let me say to the old crowd, Sister Crow, you've been in church a long time. This isn't just for young Christians. It's for us old folks. It's for, it's, it's for everybody. We all need a reset. We all need a realignment. Sometimes our head gets wrong because we buy into the ideology of the world. Oh, well, I'm past doing that now. I'm a senior citizen. You stop eating too. You stop sleeping. You stop needing money. It's, it's funny how the things of Christianity go by the wayside, but the things of the flesh don't. The devil's slick. The devil's slick, and he trips up even the most seasoned saints, because we get messed up ideology. So let's go before the Lord Jesus. Help me, my heart, my mind, and my spirit, my human spirit, God. Let the Holy Ghost move on me and restore that power to be a witness in these last days. Allow me to have that unction, that function, Allow me to be the church, God, that the gates of hell cannot prevail against in all its sinister subtleties to get me involved in things that don't matter, the cares of this life, the things of this world, and allow me to be the church in the last days. And everybody said amen. God bless you. Give somebody a high five. Say, I'm glad I'm in the church, and you can be seated. Amen. Hallelujah. The church. We live in a day today where in a lot of uh, 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 vernacular, a lot of people speaking, the church is being vilified. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what you believe. There's a whole lot written before you turn around and say, wait a minute, what do you mean it doesn't matter what you believe? He, he sure said a whole lot here. You know, how, how many taken their driver's test? How many had to read all that? Nobody? I had to read that book. I got tested on that book. Or, yeah, some of us had to study it. <laughs> a couple of times you had to take that test. The devil is a liar. Come on now. How many, how, anybody had to take it more than once? That's all right, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. If you had to study for that, don't you think your journey in life is important too? The church is a unique thing. It is a mysterious thing in the ages of time. It is a concept that is unique to this dispensation of time. The prophets of the Old Testament were never permitted to see this glorious thing called the church. We preach about them, we talk about them, but the patriarchs never 
were given the opportunity to grasp such an incredible concept, the church. The poetic writers, the kings and scribes, none of the Old Testament family of God had the revelation of the church. The church is important. The church is vital. It's something about us that we should honestly say, I love my church. I'm glad I got a church. I don't just go to any church. I go to a church that preaches right out of the Bible. That's important because today a lot of churches have been turned into a psychology center. They're more concerned about your wallet than your soul. They're more concerned about your social standing than your soul. Amen. I understand that there are elements to know how to live, but the Bible and the whole thing about God is about eternal life, not just this life. And the wonderful thing about this church and the, and the Bible that we read from is it's caring for your whole life, even the eternal life. Amen. So you won't find the church introduced in Genesis. You won't find it in the books of the law. It is described in the lyrical prose of the poets or Psalms. And, and the prophets, though they saw glimpses and, and understood in part, they never fully realized what they were saying when they prophesied that God would take a people that were not a people and make them his people. You see, there's a difference between being a people and being his people. I want to belong to God. I want to make sure that my conduct, that, that my actions, that my words, that my that co what comes out of my mouth, my mind, I want to be his. They never understood that that the church was God taking a bride for himself. Mm -hmm. The church composed of both Jews and Gentiles, bond or slaves and free, black, white, rich, poor, a group of people who could never have been united by any other means would find a common faith, an amazing salvation because of the precious blood of Jesus. Everybody say the church. Everybody say, I love my church. And that God would take a that group of people and mold it and make it into his church. Church is important to his body on this earth. We're his body on this earth. We're his hands, his feet, his voice calling to a lost world. We are the church. I'm happy that I am in and I belong to the church. See, 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 some, some people don't grasp that. But if you want to be a, a, a minister, a real one, then you belong to the church because it's not my will, thy will be done. I must decrease that he might increase. All that I am, all that I have, all that I will have, where I go, it matters. See, some of you, if I'd have went down and, I don't know, got myself a lady off the corner and got myself some Thunderbird and hung out, well, what are you talking about? It doesn't matter what I do. I'll be the pastor on Sunday, but Friday, how many would be upset about that? I belong to the church. But can we go and do what we want and have what we want and act like, well, I'm going to walk in on Sunday and critique everything, but on Friday night, Monday night, whatever, I want to belong to the church. The, the world wants to make you think, well, why do you got to do all that? Oh, wait, wait a minute. You don't understand. I'm a part of a family. This is what we do. This is what we do. You'll never hear me say, I hate the church. I don't like the church. I don't want to go to church. That's like I said, I don't want to be me. I don't want to be myself. I don't want to be full of the Holy Ghost. I don't want the things of God. I don't like the church. You know what? We got issues in the church and they got issues in the world. But I like the fact that the issues in the church are nowhere near as bad as issues in the world because we got Jesus. So our text tonight is very important because it is the first time in Scripture that the concept of the church is introduced. And if we want to know what it means to be an authentic church, 
we got to start here. Nowhere before Matthew 16 does God choose to enlighten men about his great plan that is embodied in the church. It's very important if you study the principles that govern biblical and doctrinal interpretation, you will learn that one of the governing principles, and you've heard about, heard me speak on this topic before, but is the law of first mention. Now, I don't want to get too complex here into biblical hermeneutics, but let me define the law of first mention to you, because hermeneutics is a study of interpretation. Hermeneutics plays a role in understanding subject matter. This is why it's important that you have a mentor in your life. It's important that you have a tried and true mentor. It's important that you have someone that's not only been in church a while, but they're still actively being the church. You know what I'm saying? I, in fact, in order to be actively a part of the church, you should be mentoring or winning somebody. Because that's the whole point of my text tonight is you shall be a witness. What's a witness? A witness is someone giving a testimony. Giving a testimony. An eyewitness report. An eyewitness of an experience. When's the last time you testify? Are you in the church? Hmm. So let me get into this, this first mention. It is a rule that says if you want to understand a doctrine or a principle of scripture, then you must go to the place in the word of God where it is mentioned for the first time. You hear us say the word context. See, y'all like to text. Anybody have a problem when you send something and the context is missed and they get upset at something that was a joke? Context was lost. That's why we need to know what the text means. That's context, okay? So you got to go place in the Word of God where it's mentioned for the first time. It's the, the study of first occurrence because that is where you find the fundamental or inherent meaning. The meaning introduced in that first mention in Scripture is the common theme that will resound through all future mentions of the principle or doctrine. Doctrine is a teaching or an ideology. Are you with me? Is this too much for a Wednesday night? Have I been gone too long? I'm sorry. So if you want the the heart of the doctrine or principle, you'll always find it where it is first mentioned in Scripture. This is what we have in Matthew 16. Jesus, in an intimate moment, hello, with his closest disciples. Listen, understand the texture here to the text. The sheep closest to the shepherd is the safest. The things of God should inspire you. They should they should draw you. If, if it's just let me get there and let me get home, something's happened in your spirit. Something's happened. Your human spirit has overwhelmed God's spirit and might even have ticked it pretty much all the way out. Are you hearing me? Be honest with yourself. What is your mentality or your spirituality towards the church? Don't just come in and find a position and find a seat. Your witness is a direct correlation of your position in the church, no matter what title you have. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So he's talking to his disciples, and for the very first time, the church is mentioned. This is influenced by that first mention. Everything else that will ever be revealed about the church will be colored and influenced by that first mention. If we want to understand the significance of the church, we've got to start there, okay? Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, there's a lot of preaching there, but I want to, I want to get to some other things that are said. First of all, the foundation of the church is a revelation of the identity of Jesus Christ. And sadly, a lot of churches have already misplaced that and lost that, Okay. That's not where we're going tonight. Secondly, the church is a thing built by God. Now, you have to understand what's different there is he spoke things into existence in Genesis. But he's going to construct the church, starting from a foundation and building towards perfection. Once again, that's not where I'm going tonight. I want to get to a certain point here. The third, the church belongs to him and him only. See, some people messed up and they think the church is theirs. It's his. You better conduct yourself. Across. You know what? I'm his. Careful how you handle pastor. I belong to him. 
See, I, I try to tell people that want to be in ministry here, every person that walks through that door is a gift. that God lo loved long before. Can I tell you something? God's been working on people long before they walked in here. So before you put your hands on and get off, hold on, hold on. Not only are you his, they're his. Your first order of business is not to tell them what they do, but to testify what he's done in you. If you'll spend more time testifying about your change, what's going on, see, you'll find out real witnesses testify about them and not critique about others. You see? Because when you get to the a certain ele, a, a elevated thought process in your own mind, you think, now I'm here to tell people what to do. Live a life and you're preaching a sermon every day. Right? All right. Another interesting and pertinent fact to, to be drawn from the statement that Jesus made is the actual word used to describe the body of believers. When Jesus said, I will build my church, he used a Greek word that is translated as church. The word is ecclesia, which means to call out from or called out ones. What's interesting about that is it's important concept. The church is called out. You are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you hearing me? So we, those, listen to me, that were actually born again, you've been baptized in Jesus' name, received the Holy Ghost, evidence speaking in other tongues, you are separated unto him and him alone. Now let me tell you something. You aren't just separated out from the world, you're separated unto him. Now it's easy to say, okay, I'm in the church, but are you his? How many of us, we get that paycheck, I'm going to go spend it on this and I'm going to. Or I got the whole weekend, I'm going to spend it on this. And I'm. You ever catch us sometimes our vernacular lets us know that I'm his when I need him. That makes sense? You hear what I'm saying? It's a concept. You ever hear that kid? I'm taking my stuff and I'm leaving mom and dad. Well, you take everything you bought. Go ahead. I've been through that with my, my mom. I remember one time I said, I'm leaving. About seven or eight. I go ahead and fill the door with some stuff. She said, oh, what are you doing with that stuff right there? I'm leaving. Yeah, but that belongs to Steve Crow. If you're leaving, you're not a part of this family. Get the family? You got to leave that stuff here. I'm going to put the bag down here. Where are you going now? I'm, I'm leaving. I put this. Well, where'd you get that shirt? You know, I start getting this wake up moment. See, many times we get to a place where we start thinking, I did all this. Look at the, we act like Nebuchadnezzar. Look at this glorious place that I built. You're going to find yourself out in the field eating grass here pretty soon. Hear what I'm saying? So there's a whole lot of preaching in that I will build my church. Are you hearing me? My focus tonight is actually on the next phrase because we find here one of the, the first defining characteristics of the church that I feel has been lost. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We often assume that this phrase describes a church taking on the onslaught of evil and withstanding it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The church is a mighty fortress that cannot be defeated by the brutal attack and forces of darkness. We're on defense, but the English word against is actually not present in the Greek text. If the phrase were translated as it was actually written, it would take on a, a completely different meaning. It would be, read, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not withstand it. It changes the direction. The statement, as it is written, is a powerful revelation that the gates or the strength, because that's what gates represent, or the fortifications of hell cannot withstand the church. The image given by Jesus is the image of the church on offense. How many find yourself praying on defense, uh, living on defense, uh, living of a mentality, I'm gonna barely make it, I don't wanna make it to church, I, I got a sore knee or I got this or I got, and we're constantly anemic. 
rather than anointed. I don't know about you, but I'm still inspired by the Old Testament stories and the New Testament stories of those, despite what's going on, we're going forward as the church. They did great things for the church, yet we look around today, and even our most noble seasoned saints are more walking around, barely making it from service to service, not doing anything for God. They got blessings of all the world, but they're not doing anything as the church. The devil's got you defeated because you're holed up, protecting your few little trinkets, but you're not doing the works of the church. There's some folks probably wishing I was back in Florida right about now. See, you understand the church should be storming the gates of hell. The church should be tearing down strongholds. There should be something about you. And I, I've said it myself, I remember the good old days. I remember altar calls. I remember three-hour prayer meetings. I remember amazing stuff. And, and some of us sit around and remember that. But hey, what? You know what? Us older folks need to show the younger folks that that still happens. But we become like Israel in Egypt, blessed and increased with goods, and we forget the Lord God that brought us out of Eden. We don't have the casting down powers and principalities anymore. Like, oh God, let me just get through another service. This is the truth of what it means to be an authentic church. You know what? I, I, I get it. When we're separated uh, uh, out of, that's great. You got holiness standards. You got long sleeves. You got the right haircuts. You got the right clothes. You got all that. But then you stop there and you quit going on offense. You become offensive to the new people coming in but you haven't gone on offense against the gates of hell. You stag you, you're stuck. You're in the church, but you're not the church. I stop preaching. Amen. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. One of the things that bothers me is I've met hundreds of thousands of wonderful people. I think people are amazing. I, I, just it's amazing. I love to sit and talk with people and hear about them. And, but the one subject that really just makes my skin crawl is when they start talking about the church and Christianity. You get so many different views. I'm like, who, who told you that? Where did you get that? And they think, well, I really don't know. I can tell you how. The church defense instead of on offense. We think, oh, this is a scary time. Did you not read early church's time? Well, I'm afraid to speak out because if I really, see, some of you think you speak out, but you only speak out to people you feel comfortable to speak out to. You'll tell me about, well, bless God, I can't believe what this country's doing. But are you going to go out there and tell someone out there that needs to hear it? Maybe their family's falling apart. Maybe their kids are going nuts. We live in a time right now that every family in America needs to hear about the church because we got young kids killing themselves. We got, we got parents running quickly to the psychologists and putting their kids on drugs and medication to alter their mind when if you just look back 30, 40 years ago, kids didn't have these problems because every Sunday they were in church. You got a problem with your car, you take it back to the builder. You got a problem with yourself, take it back to your creator. We've left that. We've skipped that out. And even the seas and saints have stopped it. We're afraid to talk to our family. We're afraid to lay it off. They might not like me anymore. It may make a sticky situation at home. I remember back in the day, you put your elbows on the table. That a smack. You didn't care if you cried about it. We got people walking around thinking they're bad to the bone. Jesse James. But you ain't got enough guts to stand up and tell your own kids, hey, that's not what I taught you. That's not what I showed you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hey, dads, don't be one way at home and another way at church. Your kids will need medication. <laughs> Hallelujah. All the powers of darkness cannot withstand the powerful force that is the called church. 
watched as we went through COVID, even church people getting mad, and mad at God. You know why? You're in the church, but you're not the church. You didn't hit, hit prayer time to seek God for advice to move forward. You saw God get mad at him because you didn't like what you was going through. And you don't realize the church signs the greatest in trouble. Hold on. This is going to sting. The church shines great in trouble. Well, why didn't you shine? Stop being the church. John 14 and 12, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. How many believe? Not everybody wanted to, because they know what's coming. See, the problem is knowing the word and living the word are two different things. The works that I do shall he do also, and great works as he shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Listen, this is that church. This is that upper room church in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost church where the fire falls because they tarried in one mind and one accord and they believed they didn't care what was going on on the outside. And when it erupted on the inside, it spilled out and created an opportunity to testify. This is that. This is the greatest thing. Well, they had a different, no, no, no. You have to understand, they only had a handful of people at the beginning. In fact, the authorities at that time, the people at that time regarded, regarded the church folks as ordinary, simple-minded, unlearned, ignorant men and women. Isn't that how they look at us today? In fact, they were at the beginning just 12 men. I'm sure there were some unspecified number of other followers that were not in the core group. But nonetheless, there were some other people. They had nothing going for them. There was no great names, no degrees, no financial security. They didn't have a marketing plan. There were no advertising things going on. They had, they had nothing at all. They were nobodies. Yet what we know today about the first century authentic apostolic church is mind-boggling. Their, their story is staggering. They turned their world upside down. Are you the church? And you're afraid to tell your own family. You're tell, afraid to tell your own family. You're afraid to go on the offense and go, this is the greatest thing in my life. This saved me. This is keeping me from a devil's hell. This is, that you need to know about this. Well, I don't know what they're going to find when they come to my church. They're going to find you. Make it what it's supposed to be. It's a sad day. We will want to show off our stuff at home, but we don't want to show off our spirit at church. Can I, I can say ouch there. They were evangelists, every one of them. They preached Jesus Christ and the cross everywhere to anybody who would listen. We, do we have anybody like that tonight? Do we have anybody here that's like sitting there realizing what I'm preaching going, you know what, I've kind of slipped into just coming to church. I kind of slipped in mentally and spiritually and emotionally. I just come in and bide my time. Is there anybody here? I'm, 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 if I get just one, I'll be happy. To step into real apostolic Christianity. Talking that book of Acts stuff. Is anyone really, is there anybody here that said, you know, Jesus, I need to be set on again for this stuff? I mean, it's not like. I mean, I don't want to be offensive, but I I, I want to I want to make a point here. The fact that there was just a handful of unlearned, ignorant people turn the world upside down, according to Luke seventeen and six. I think we I think we can do that. I, I think there's some folks here that you know what? If we shake ourselves and wake ourselves and quit just coming to church and being the church, we can do this. He's given us power to be witnesses. Maybe tonight you just need to find an altar and have an old-fashioned Holy Ghost hold down and get the Holy Ghost all over again so that when you leave here, world, watch out. I'm back. I'm here. I'm coming. I'm on fire. I'm the church. You have to understand that these 12 ignorant men that even 
Within two centuries, Christianity became the most powerful force in all of the Roman Empire. It was affecting the entire known world. It was just... What did the devil do? Let's get them fighting each other that they will. At the end of the third century, the church had become such a powerful force that the Roman emperor named Constantine deemed it a wise move to officially declare that the Roman Empire was a Christian empire. Now, let me say this. You have to understand, and I don't want to get into this tonight, but if you watch the politics of a nation, they follow the flow. And the problem America has right now is there's a lot of people going to a church. But we don't have enough going to the church and then leaving and being the church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You know why it was that way back then? The gates of hell cannot withstand that church. One well, of the most wicked, sensual, violent, and humanistic societies in the history of the world cannot stand against the powerful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was preached by the church. They could not stop the truth. Some of us hold on to the truth. I'm in the church. But are you? the church that will exit tonight. When you go home, are you looking right now? Are you on reconnaissance? Are you on a mission? Are you leaving? Because you know that this world needs Jesus and you have him and he has you and you're ready to declare him and be that Acts 1 and 8 Christian. I've been empowered to be a witness. I gotta tell somebody. No human force could have conquered Rome. No army was big or great enough to conquer Rome. No military tactician was skilled enough to take on Rome. But the church, in a short span, three centuries, completely overwhelmed all the forces. Christianity is still one of the greatest phenomena in history. I didn't get into a whole lot of details when I wrote this, but you know what? Christianity survived Greece. Rome, Hitler, and I want to say this, the church will also survive American Nazism, New World Order, and atheism. Every one of you should have, should, have, should have stood up and shouted that. I understand that. Look, I'm not a dummy. I know, I know when some dude's coming after me. I know I can tell when someone squares up. I can tell they walk in the room and they adjust their pants and they, okay, that ain't telling me they're going to be kind. And I see so the problem with some of you, you're going to walk out of here, you'll act bad and worship in here, but you're going to walk up. Let me just get you till next Sunday without a fight. I think it's time we look for, embrace the conflict. There is a call to arms. There is a call to arms. For all the anointed apostolic people that just don't come to church, they are the church. There's got to be something about us that it affects what we eat and where we sleep, where our money goes, where our time goes, our finances to be the. You can't turn nothing upside down if you won't be something when you leave here. That humble little church that Jesus established emerged as one of the premier defining influences in the history of the world. They've been burning Bibles. They're going to start burning Bibles. They're already denying what you can read now. They're already doing things right now, but it doesn't matter. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So the question that comes to mind is why would we ever structure the church as just a fortified structure or even the concept of just to withstand the onslaught of hell? Whoever sold us that bill of goods? Some of y'all bought in. Because that doesn't sound at all like the authentic first century church that Jesus established. He said, all the fortifications and all the strongholds of hell will never be able to withstand the advance of the church. For too long we viewed the church as just a hiding place. Mm -hmm. just trying to withstand the waves of evil and darkness generated by the powers of hell. But we need to realign our thinking with what Jesus actually said 
when he established that my church, a mighty army of believers that will not be denied. I'm coming for my family. I'm coming for my neighbors. I'm coming for my co-workers. I'm coming in prayer for my... Uh, I got one in the church, praise God. I, I, I'm happy with that, brother. I'm praying. Come on, brother. Hallelujah. The church that he established, brother Corey, is a great and powerful force that puts all the power of darkness to flight. It's those people that'll stand up when everybody else is bowing, being willing to be thrown in to the fiery furnace of social exclusion. But still stand as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah. A powerful church will run drugs and addiction down and slay it. I can testify about that. The power of the church will brutalize carnality and destroy it. I can testify about that. The church in all its power can bring the beacon of truth and light, the light of anybody that'll say, Jesus, as for me and my like my hope, I'm ready to fight. I want to go forward. My hope will be a beacon of truth. We're the church. That's our heritage. Stop talking about the good old days and talk about the glory of God. And we'll experience it right now. I don't know about you, but I'm not here to sit by and watch hell get the victory over our families. No, no one. And that's where people get confused. That's where people get a little misaligned with the heart of a pastor or a shepherd. You don't understand when you backslide, when you leave the church, if it didn't bother or hurt the shepherd, he wasn't one. Are you out of your mind? Do you know how many nights and days and this time is spent in praying and, and, and working with and investing it? And if you could turn around and walk away, oh, no big deal. Hello? I don't know about you, but the church will not be satisfied to watch he'll wreak havoc in our world. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to sit back and watch. I recognize what's going on. It's time to stand, stand up and be louder than ever. The church will not be satisfied to sit back in a defensive posture only. Well, I'm going to walk humbly and softly before the Lord. But you still got to be a beacon of light to the world. A lot of times we think, well, if I don't say anything, I can't. I'm not, I don't think the church should sit back and watch the world race headlong into the fires of hell. There ought to be someone getting upset at us for calling them out. There ought to be somebody getting upset at you for your stance. There needs to be somebody that's conflicted against you because of your stance for God. Let me say it like this. If they're not wanting to crucify you, are you really like Jesus? If they're not upset at you, if they're not plotting against you, if they're not upset and wanting to hurt you, are you really like Jesus? I get it. We got so many people. They call themselves Christians. We got so many. I get it. We have churches on every corner. But stop and ask yourself. If nobody's changing and becoming more like him, maybe someone's not there. What about the Holy Ghost? Because if you do, you will reach like you've never reached before after this tonight. We have an offense to run. Because some of you have been on defense for too long. It's time we prayed like we never prayed before. <laughs> when we will give all our might and pull some of the fires of hell. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Before it's too late, it is time to make a difference. The darkness cannot contain us. Because we walk in light as he is in the light. Oh, you hear the strongholds of hell can't withstand us. The powers and principalities that wreak their havoc in our world are subject to Jesus' name. Maybe some of you... 
If you want authority in the word, you've got to be under authority to the word. Wicked principalities are powerless to resist a church that recognizes its role. So the real question tonight in our Bible study, what did the church accomplish throughout history? That's not the question. It's not. The real question tonight is not what it accomplished throughout history. The real question is how did they accomplish it? Not what. Now, the message of the church is what makes it so powerful. It's about, we got too many people wanting to be seen. We got too many people wanting their name up in life. We got too many people wanting them to know them. When you know what, you should be the, the greatest disappearing act of your life to where instead of seeing you, we see Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's still about that old rugged cross. If you get all beside yourself and you get offended, you get hurt in the church because maybe you didn't get used. I'm going to tell you something. The problem is, is that you think your ministry is here when your ministry is there. It's there. Well, I got a title in the church. I don't give a rip. What's your title out there? What are you known for out there? Are you hearing me? The effectiveness of the church as a catalyst for spiritual and cultural change is embodied in the message of the church. Yeah, I don't have a message, and you shouldn't have a message. The church has a message. That's how they had such a powerful impact on their world. They were an evangelistic church because they realized there was power in their message. See, the problem, some of you, is you struggle with finding a message because you're wanting to say something and God can't speak through you. Let's all say it together. One, two, three. Ouch. See, you can, if, if you have a, I'm going to be honest, when you get a word from God, I don't care, it can be the silliest concept in the world, but if you know it's from God, you'll preach it. Mm-hmm. weren't ashamed. They were not intimidated. They didn't look at themselves as some kind of second-class citizens. They realized that if they could share their message, are you hearing me? It had within itself the power to transform lives. Let me help you. Get over yourself and get into Jesus. So often we get caught up in ourselves and all of our inabilities we look at everything we can't do. But can I tell you right now, tonight, that if you've been given a, given a powerful message, if you will just share it, the message will do the work. I said the message will do the work. This small little 12-man man started out and carried the gospel to the world. They declared the gospel to the strong and to the weak, to the rich and to the poor, to the powerful and the powerless. They spread it. Let me tell you something. That parable of the soils and the seed, some of you have missed another side of that parable. And you now declare and you're placing one little seed where it'll think it'll grow. And the devil's got you so stowed up and bowed up that you're looking at, where can I put my little seed? Come on, Pastor. Come on. I tell you right here and right now, I'm the last parcel of soil anybody should have sowed seed in. And if there's some honest men in here and women, you'll stand up and say, I wasn't that great of soil either. I wasn't the best soil, but thank God someone sowed it in my life. Thank God someone reached out. Thank God a pastor preached to me. Thank God a Sunday school teacher didn't question me. Thank God they sowed the seed into this rough old soil. Thank God someone was busy being the church. Spread the gospel. It works. It stands on its own feet. They were a revival church, a growing church. They reached their world. 
through the power of the gospel, not programs and slick things. Let's just share the word of God to a dying world. Cast the net. Let's see what you catch, but you can't catch if you're not casting. Romans 1 and 16. For I am not ashamed of the... Let me, let me give you something else. I'm going to finish that in a minute. The problem is you're too proud of something else. Oh. I know it's truth because that was in the anointing. You can read my notes. That's not there. Help that. Some of you are too proud of other things. It slayed you. It's hindered you. It's tripped you. It's halted you. Let me finish this verse and maybe someone will walk out of here being the church again. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the God. Do you lack the power of God? There's something else more important to you. There's something you're more proud about. You've forgotten where God has brought you from and you think you got there yourself and now you're more proud of that. It tells us a whole lot more about you if the first thing comes out of your mouth is things you've accomplished rather than what God's done for you. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. See, are you more proud of what you've done in this life than the fact that Jesus provided a way of salvation for anybody? Maybe it's time we pick up a mirror and go, wait a minute. You know, I really don't want to be looking at your life. I want to be looking at mine. Am I the church or do I just attend? Am I ashamed of the gospel because I'm more proud of something else? I would rather tell them about my accomplishments, my PhDs, my, my letters on the wall, my, well, my money in the bank, the size of my house. And we become ashamed. I, Hmm. See, because the authentic church believed in that powerful message. What the world needs is not another religious movement. They don't need you and your religious movement. And you're still, they, they don't need to have sleeves like you and hair like you and a dress like you and pants like you. You know what they need first? The same salvation you had. The problem is, oh, see, you made your religion more important than his salvation. That stings a little bit, don't it? The world doesn't need another religious movement. In fact, the city doesn't need another church building. What our people need and what this world needs is a life-changing message of Jesus Christ. It needs more saints of God reaching like never before. It needs a pastor preaching like never before. A pastor's wife praying like never before. Amen. And if you're going to be a bishop and a, and a bishop's wife, and if you're going to be a Sunday school teacher, and if you're going to be a minister, and if you're going to be, if you're going to be, maybe you need to get back in spirit life. That's the, it's, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. For it is the power of God. Oh, don't come strutting in here thinking you're something. I need the power of God to get out of bed and to walk today. We have a message that still sets the captives free, and such were some of you. We have a message that binds up the brokenhearted, and such were some of you. Lifts up the discouraged, and such were some of you. That fills the emptiness that exists in everyone. Oh, we need the power of God in the church. We got to publish it far and wide. The key to revival lies in our message of hope and deliverance. We were called to share that message, not ours.
This isn't a place to pick a bone and to, to, to put across your own little thing that's caught up in your craw. We're called to be evangelists of this great truth. In the first century church, you find every believer empowered by the Holy Ghost. Speaking in all places to everyone, sharing the message of truth and salvation. They declared Jesus. They shared with everyone the need to be baptized in Jesus' name. It's what they said. They told anyone that would listen about the power of the Holy Ghost. And those that didn't want to listen would throw them in jail. And they'd go to jail. They would stone them. And they'd get stoned. You have to understand, if you're not having conflict, or you have to ask yourself some questions. If your greatest conflict is in here, Because God added daily to the church because they weren't just Sunday church or Wednesday church. They were everyday church daily sharing the gospel. It's a sad day when the most uh, considered the titled people in the church walk in here at 10 after the shirt prayer started. Ready? Are you hearing me? If you're important and you, if that's okay, then you're not okay. You're singing tonight and you can't make it on time? You're singing or doing this, but you can't take a church cleaning day? Oh, uh, believe me, then leader, leadership's beyond you. Do we have any everyday believers in the house of God tonight? God. Not just when, ah, you're clapping now, will you clap tomorrow? Yes. In Acts 8, Philip was in Samaria talking to some folks about God. Then Peter and John started praying for folks in the town square and folks were filled with the Holy Ghost and were baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 10, Peter was found in Cornelius' house telling him about the power of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 19, Paul ran into the disciples of John and started talking to them about the Holy Ghost and baptism in Jesus' name. They talked to people in the streets. They talked to people at the grocery store or markets. They talked to people wherever they, they were the church. They were involved in it. They weren't trying to spread their ideology. They were so busy sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ they turn the world upside down. What am I talking about? The church. They were waiting for people. See, the devil's got some of you caught up in the arrogance. Oh, I'll wait till I find some of that. Oh, that's not what they did. They considered any soul an open door for the gospel. That's what the church does. And Jesus told his followers that they would receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon them and that they would be witnesses unto him. The initial function. You're brand new in church. What should you do? What should you be a witness? Just be a witness of Jesus Christ. And that, you know, that's where we all start. That's the first class. That's the kindergarten, if you will. And I believe some maybe need to retake this class. Be a witness. Testify of Jesus. If the first thing out of your mouth is you, what you've got, what you've accomplished, of you know, one for Jesus. There's, there's something wrong with our humanity. Can we be honest with ourselves? I fight with my humanity. There's something about our nature when we walk in anywhere, the church, the grocery store, we want to be looked at as being successful or accomplished. The ideology of the world has made us so bad that we have people today that sacrifice their entire financial future to have the right shoes for today. And some of you judge them because you're financially stable now, but you still were more worried about your image than reflecting his image. And you come to church, but when you leave, you're not the church. You see, you have to understand, be a witness and testify. It's a courtroom concept. The world, the world needs you to testify the goodness of Jesus to keep them out of hell. You have to understand, there's a giant courtroom going on, and the only way people won't be condemned to hell 
is because you're standing up to testify and witness about the goodness of God. I'm, a, I'm an eyewitness. Uh, I experienced that. Uh, I was there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is how the church will overcome the power of hell. This is how the church tears down the strongholds and pulls down the spiritual wickedness in high places. This is how families and homes are rescued. The church needs to be witness of Jesus Christ. It doesn't need to be prettied up. It doesn't need to be altered. It doesn't need to be changed. Are you hearing me? The word stands on its own feet. This concept is repeated several places in the book of Acts. In Acts 1 and 22, a replacement is sought for Judas that will be a witness with us. It's what it says. In Acts 10 and 39, all of the church was declared to be witnesses. In Acts 10 and 42, God commanded them all to testify. In Acts 26 and 16, Paul says that he was called to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, this is the very center of what it means to be an authentic apostolic church. We are witnesses of Jesus Christ. And if you ever amen anything in your life, it needs to be that. If you had anything punctuate what your life means, it should be that. It's the highest function to share what they had received, to bear witness of Jesus Christ, to declare the greatness of his person, the beauty of his spirit, the wonders of his work, and the amazing grace that he brought us. Old Testament Israel saw itself as the keepers of heaven's greatest secrets, the guardians of the greatest truths ever known, but the church saw itself as the witness of Jesus Christ. They were called, and you are called to Testify means to make a solemn declaration under oath for the purpose of establishing a fact, in parentheses, as a court. The second, to make a statement based on personal knowledge or belief. Bear witness, to serve as evidence or proof. The church is to tell loud and long what God has done for our lives. The church is not a storehouse to stockpile the stoically saved. It's a lighthouse to reach the lost. You know what? I think it's, it's poetic and it's beautiful that we got a lighthouse out there. It's wonderful. But the greatest lighthouse this church will ever produce is you and I. Some of us get sideways if it's not functioning, it's not working. I get it's not right now. But the biggest problem is not that that's not working. The biggest problem is that we're not working. Is your light on? Is it, are, you, are you sending out that beacon of hope to anybody and everybody about the power of Jesus Christ? See, the church is a place where sinners, saved by grace, gather together to hear the preaching and teaching to improve and get a closer walk with God. Evangelism is to share our testimony, telling others of the great grace and wonderful salvation of Jesus Christ. It may have been a few years since then, but to be an authentic church means we need to still get back to telling people about that plan of salvation that saved such a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm still excited about it. I'm still happy about it. The greatest thing in my life is not my bank account. It is not my home. It's not anything else. The greatest thing in my life is the church, the house of God. There's one old joker in the Old Testament got messed up and he ran into the sanctuary, grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar and said, I'll die here. He wouldn't have been that predicament if he'd been doing that all along in the first place. Sadly, some of us think that our accomplishments and our homes and our possessions are more important. We don't realize the greatest thing we are is the church. Jesus told the disciples, after the Holy Ghost has come, you will be witnesses of me. The disciples were already witnesses of the life, teachings, and miracles of Jesus Christ. They were. But the focus of this statement by Jesus is on a personal experience. After the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will then be witnesses of me. 
the beginning, the kindergarten, after you receive the Holy Ghost, the disciples or believer will share more than just the stories of the life of Jesus' death and resurrection. I appreciate Easter, but it's the Pentecost that, that we've got to have. You need the Pentecostal experience. You testify of a deeply personal experience with God. I can tell you the moment that everything changed. I can point to it. I can tell you about And I've even got witnesses of it. After the upper room, the disciples were doing more than just sharing the story that had already become familiar to their culture. Everybody already knew about the crucifixion. They were testifying from the depth of a personal experience with God. The infilling of the Holy Ghost transforms the testimony. The infilling of the Holy Ghost transforms your testimony. Maybe you need to get a refilling. Maybe you just need to humble yourselves. You really want to walk humbly before God? Find yourself in an altar and don't leave until you're speaking in tongues again. Oh, I feel you struggling. I'll pray for you. I know who you are. But they were admonished. Yep. Before they could have told of his life, his teachings, his suffering, his death, his burial, and even his resurrection, they were admonished to tarry in Jerusalem wait in an upper room because the power of their testimony would rise from their personal experience with God as he filled them with the glorious gift of the Holy Ghost. It would transform everything. You can't testify of that which you haven't personally experienced. You will get jaded. You will get sideways. You will get discouraged. Everything in the human spirit will do anything to justify where you're at when you just need a good old praying through. The key to authentic evangelism is an authentic experience with God. Authentic church. Powerful church and evangelism rises from authentic relationship with God. How can you become a great witness without the experience? Sadly, some of us through trials of life and situations have been snuffed out. Thank God he won't quench a smoking flax. He's looking to ignite you. But like you ran to an altar back then, you need to go to an altar. Right now. If a religion alone, and I'm going to bring this to a close, could transform the world, it would have been done long ago. If just the story of the life, death, burial, and resurrection was enough, the whole world would be saved by now. But the power, the effectiveness of the testimony rises from a personal experience with God. The strength of a witness lies in a first-hand experience. There is no strength. There is no validity to the witness of a second or third-hand recipient of knowledge. You can't stand in court, testify about something you heard about, that they were experienced. If the call to be a witness of Jesus Christ was simply a call to share the story of his life, death, and burial, then the only reliable witnesses have been long dead. And that's the beauty of that. The indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Make each and every one of us a powerful believer, a first-hand witness of the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Mm. That's why the word witness is used. That's what turned the world upside down. That's what caused Rome to crumble from within. That's what tears down the enemy's strongholds, the testimony of real people with a real experience with a real God. They're looking for it. They're dying for it. They're begging for it. That's what it means to be a truly apostolic, authentic church. It's more than just telling of, of a familiar story. It's the telling of your story and the power of God's intervention. Acts 1 and 8 is the foundational imperative of authentic church. It's a timeless truth of what it really means to be God's people. More than your clothing, 
more than your biblical or political position, more than titles, is the witnessing and declaring of Jesus. Acts 1 and 8 begins with, but, putting it in direct contrast with Acts 1 and 7. Instead of being concerned with times and seasons, and I've seen some of you be so adamant about your understanding of pre, mid, or post, but you've completely missed the imperative of right now. You got caught and stuck in verse 7, and you missed verse 8. See, we're not to be busy, concerned with the times or seasons. We're to focus on being Christ's witnesses to the very end of the earth. That's our concern. That's our calling. Why he's coming back is not when he's coming back. That's not our primary concern. Trying to figure out the seasons, the time, politically, what it all says. That's not our concern. Our concern according to Jesus, according to Jesus, our primary concern is what we'll be doing when he chooses to return. What are you doing? What are you doing? Because it's not about the when. It's about the what. The primary purpose of the church is to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Let's stand. Hallelujah. For those of you listening at home, for you here right now, I believe the true church will be witnesses of Jesus Christ. I don't believe that we are called to alleviate hell on earth. We are not called to mitigate every disaster and injustice in the world. We're not called to chase everything we don't like and, and try to just to get comfortable in this world. We are called to pull people from the very hot fires of an eternal hell before it's too late. It's time to shake ourselves, stir ourselves in the Holy Ghost and realize I don't want to chase politics and problems. I want to chase after the plan of Jesus and pull as many out of the fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God. We may not feed all the hungry and we may not put clothes on all the naked but if we don't spread the gospel who will? Now let me help some of y'all. I know church evangelism outreach and witness is a deeply personal thing. It is really not a function of the corporate church. We, we, we sit down in our meetings, well, what are you going to do about outreach? Can I tell you why I, my, 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 I just grip my teeth on that? It was never supposed to be a program. It's your first calling. What's Brother Crow going to do to build the church? What's Brother Crow going to do? Well, I guess God, he shouldn't do this. He should do that. He should do it. We need a meeting. We need this. You know what we need? We need authentic Christians. Do I really need to be spending all my nights and evenings and time here trying to put a program, put a banner out? To, or should we just be the church of the living God, letting people know I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For I know that it is the power of God unto salvation. It all hinges on you and I when we leave here being the real deal, being authentic. Mm -hmm. I don't care about your sleeves. I don't care of what, well, I don't care about none of that. If you can't get the first order of Christianity right, how is it that a woman at the well who Jesus just spoke to for a few moments could run out and get an entire city back and you filled with the Holy Ghost can't even get your own family to church. Because it's more than just showing the church. Lacey, you are as powerful as me. Amen. Amen.
My, my position, my title, my clothes, my years of service do not make me any more powerful than you, young lady. You can go out there right here and right now, and you can reach anybody right now because you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. Anybody that's not ashamed can be anointed and powerful. You just got to get focused on not just coming to church, but being the church. You'll always have a message. You'll always have something to say. You'll always have a word from God. And I know I'm going long, but I got to ask some questions as we wrap it up. When was the last time you shared your personal testimony? When was the last time you let this powerful message work? How can you really have a personal revival if you can't even open your mouth and declare what God has done for you? So I want to challenge Souls Harbor Church. Get the word out that Jesus is in this house. Go spread the word. That is the catalyst for revival. We have to be an evangelistic church because we believe in God. We will be an apostolic church when we're more concerned about making sure that we are witnesses. God didn't do all those things for you to brag about what he's done for you. Oh, look what God did for me. Got me this job, got me that job. No, no, they need to hear about the plan of salvation. We need to be evangelistic. We need to get back on offense. It's our calling to plant the seed and water it and let God give the increase. But there can't be any increase if you don't share the message and sow the seed. Testify. Testify. It will save you. You want to overcome the enemy of your soul? Are you ready? And I'm closing with this. Revelations 12, 10 and 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they, and they, and they, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death.